All right, thanks everybody, welcome. Um, this, uh, this presentation covers um, functional programming techniques, a few of them, as a way with dealing some of the baggage that accumulates in uh, code bases in a procedural style. So we usually invoke the dry principle. So everyone knows what dry. Don't repeat yourself, right? Um, when we pull shared code out of some uh, modules or applications and, and put them in their own space. But dry is more than just shared code. Um, dry means one source of truth. And this applies to um, data and algorithms, but it also applies to something that we don't often think about, and that is business logic. Um, we often forget this when we do procedural programming uh, because we're focusing on the data and the transformations on that data. Um, CRUD systems are especially susceptible to um, pushing business logic out up to the application layer, um, which causes each application that uses those CRUD primitives to duplicate the business logic over and over. So sharing code in a library does not make it dry. Um, one of the points I want to make clear is the difference between intent and mechanics. Uh, good code and good architecture clearly communicate their intent and minimizes the mechanisms you need to know about or be exposed to to understand what's going on and how to use the system. This is usually done with small functions that follow the Unix philosophy of doing one thing and doing it well. As a reference, this is a diagram of a certain method in HP Common. Um, the boxes represent chunks of code inside of a method that are dedicated to some specific behavior. Um, the height of each box I've sized to be proportional to the number of lines of code in that method, so as a percentage. So of the 269 lines, which is an obscene length for a function, um, only the lines in blue here in the diagram are functionality within the scope of concern for that function. Um, the rest of the beige boxes, 85% of the code in this function, are, or, are orthogonal to the concerns of what the function does. Uh, Further, there are 39 if statements and 53 conditionals in this function. Do you know how many paths uh, through the code that creates? Hundreds of paths through the code. Uh, can you test that? Not reasonably. Um, all of these beige, beige chunks cannot be separately tested without the full application running in a deployed stack. So can we agree that this puts a huge burden on the developer or the tester to know where to go to track down a problem or to make a change? That's, that's pretty hard stuff. Um, I'll try to be rigorous in my terms, but um, I'll probably mix them a little bit. <coughs> For our purposes, a procedure is a set of code with a name. Uh, so is a subroutine. Um, a function may or may not have a name. Uh, pure functions have no side effects and don't mutate state. Um, a method is some behavior attached to an object. Uh, but all of these things are just the same name for encapsulating uh, action, a process, some behavior, or an algorithm. So we'll set the stage here. Um, we have in a database a customer table and an employee table. Both of these tables have an ID column, a name, an email, some other information about those things. And we've been asked to make a, let's say, a wall board or some application whose only purpose is to print an HTML table of uh, the ID and name of the, um, of the customers coming in. So uh, we won't be starting off with a perfect application. Um, for this presentation, we're going to take the state of things as we generally find them today and assume that this is an application you have inherited or copy-pasted from somewhere else. So here's the application as, as, as we have it or as we wrote it, let's say. Um, we connect to the database. Uh, we uh, get a statement handle. This is the statement handle. So um, please raise your hand if you understand this code. This is, this is basically familiar to you. Okay, for the rest of you, um, this here, uh, DBI is Perl's database 
abstraction module. It uh, allows us to do things like this to connect to a variety of different kinds of databases, flat files, uh, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres. In, in this case, we're using the SQLite driver. Um, we give it the name of the database, customer.db. Uh, if we're unable to connect, we're going to fail with a die message. Um, this section down here takes this handle here, dbh handle, and we invoke a prepare statement. What this creates is called a prepared query. That is, um, it doesn't actually run the query, but it gets everything set up and returns this, it's called a statement handle, that we can use later to then, when we're ready, run the, run the query and fetch the results back. Any questions about this? So once this is done, we invoke the to HTML method, which we, which we are about to write. And this is the to HTML method here. We receive some arguments. I'm going to flip back one slide. You can see the arguments we're passing in are title, and we're passing in the statement handle, because that's where the data is for the rows that we need in our HTML table. So we receive those arguments and put them up in percent args. Um, there's a function, we'll call it HTML start. I'm not going to illustrate that for you, but it prints out the open HTML tag, the open head. Uh, it uses the title from the arguments, close head, and then um, open body tag for HTML. Um, we execute our statement handle. This is actually going out to the database and executing that query. It does not fetch the results back yet. We are going to print out the word uh, table in HTML, op table open tag. Now we're going to, in a loop, fetch each row of the results. And remember, we were asking for ID and name, in this case, of the customer. And we're going to print a row. So there we fetch the arguments, or we fetch one argument, or one row. And then for each row, that, that while there are rows to be fetched, we create a, uh, a, a table row in HTML. We print all this out uh, when that's done. We, uh, we finish, finish the table tag, and then we print the end HTML, which would be the closed body and the closed HTML tag. Any questions to this point? So let's look at this a moment. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Perl, oh, oh, customer. There we go. It prints out. Uh, there's the start HTML chunk. Here's the table tag. And for each row in the database, we print out their ID and, and their name. This is from Happy Days. OK. So we also have an employee application that works basically the same. The only difference between the employee application and the customer application are these three strings here. Instead of connecting to the customer database, we're going to connect to the employee database and so forth. And we're going to change the title of the, of the um, HTML page. The to HTML method is identical to the other one uh, because we used CP inheritance. Anyone know CP inheritance? Copy-paste. Garth gets it. Copy-paste inheritance. Um, so let's run this. Perl01 employee. And there's the employees. They're all named Scott, apparently. So that's great. So what we have here are, um, let's think back to grade school math. Do you remember how to factor, uh, do prime factorization of a number? You're given some number, and um, you first divide by 2, right? Until you can't divide by 2 anymore, then you divide by 3 and so forth. And finally, you get to a point where all you have are primes left. You have factored out. The, the, the redundant information from that number. So what we're going to do is something similar to that. Uh, we're going to pull out the shared code from each of those applications and put it into a new module called html.pm. So we'll look at this one. Uh, let's, let's, let's look at the um, employee. So we can see all, all we've done really is taken out all that two HTML method that used to be there and we've loaded now, uh, the, two, the new module that we've created, HTML. And, and customer, I hope, also works. And it does. That's great. So we've pulled out some redundant code, right? And put it into its own package. And then we import that package in, uh, to get the behavior that we want in the applications. So 
Is this good or bad? Did we do a good thing? Yes. Why, why is it good? We, 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 now if we need to make a change in the HTML table, we just have to go to one place, right? If we wanted to add a style to, a, to the row or to something like that. But what we've done also is we've split our application into two pieces. Remember, they're still coupled through that database handle. I'm passing that database handle from the application into the HTML layer. But our modules now, are, our applications are very small, and we have a nice, tidy HTML uh, package, and we feel pretty good about this. Um, and so we deploy it. It's awesome. Somebody says, can we make a change to the customer page, but not the employee page? So how would we make this change? Yeah, we make an if statement. We can, we can just look at the title, right? We don't have to change the applications at all. We know that, that the applications are passing the title information in. So we can just key off of that right here in the blue square. If it, if it's a, if it matches customer, we know we're, we're printing the customer page. And we can then add the, uh, add the email address. This is a bad idea. It works. Um, there. Now we've got, now we've got uh, all their email addresses. So you can email your fans, uh, your, your favorite celebrities. Um, I've also got now um, some tests. Oops, and they didn't work. Why is that? Oh. I think I have to set in test dear, yeah. O3. There. Okay, all okay. So I've set up some little tests that make sure that uh, we get exactly what we want, that we're expecting. So when we, we print the HTML page out, I, I, I simply do a string compare against what I know it should be. So this is great. Um, what have we done? <clears throat> yeah, we've used the title display parameter and added new meaning to it. Right? We've made that title parameter that was just for display purposes now part of the application logic, or the business, business logic. So that's the opposite of refactoring. So what, what should we have done instead? What, what's, what's one thing we could do instead of, of keying off of the title tag? Yeah. So what we want is a, a different argument, right? So we might do something like this. So instead of pass, keying off of the title, we actually dedicate an argument to this. We'll have to change our application. Instead of passing in a title and the rows, we also have to pass in a new um, argument. But this is probably good because this is an application concern. We want this application to behave differently from the other one. So we pass in a, a new flag. Let's look at this. Uh, customer. And that still works. And we'll run my prove statement here. And everything looks good. Is this good or bad? Is this better, worse? It's a little better, right? Because we have um, we've we've taken the uh, we've we've given title back its its concern. It's really just a display thing. Um, but in some ways, this isn't uh, significantly better. I, I want you to cultivate the reflex of throwing up in your mouth just a little bit when you see this kind of split behavior in your in your you know in your modules. Um, it's kind of a code smell. We basically have two functions now, don't we? Uh, one goes through one path, and then um, if, if a different application is calling it, it goes through a slightly different path. I guess one gauge we can use for a general purpose library, which is what we strive for, is would this work on CPAN? So if this is really an HTML.pm that we would put on CPAN, it's, it's, let's call it HTML table.pm. It's just for printing an HTML page with a table based on some rows. This whole is customer notion People go, what's this is customer thing sitting in here? So what we might try instead would be something a little bit more like this. I think maybe, JT, this is what you were getting at. Let's make the columns an argument so that the application decides what columns to print out. 
like that. Um, we have to change our application again. But again, this is, this is still probably a good thing. So instead of passing in is email or uh, is customer, uh, yes? You could actually make it so you wouldn't have to change the application because you could just default to show all columns in the event that they didn't. OK. And so we would change the employee one to, to pass in ID and name. Right? That's the inverse thing. But uh, we'll, we'll let the application choose what, uh, what columns to specify, what columns it wants to specify. But point well taken. Um, and, and, and this, 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 uh, this seems to work uh, just fine. Let's, uh, let's run that. Everything looks good. We've only made a couple of little changes. Um, and this is typically as far as we go in procedural programming. We transform the conditionals into parameters. And it feels a little bit better in most cases. When you only have a couple of parameters, this is probably OK. Um, as long as those parameters are not forking the behavior of the function. So we can now imagine, however, if we extended this out into the future, we could anticipate other changes being requested of us. We might anticipate, um, uh, uh, so this is basically where we are now. I have exploded the arguments into actual named arguments here rather than stuffing them into a hash just so we can see what's going on here. This is a... Um, uh, I wanted to make clear the arity of the function. Arity has to do with how many arguments your function takes. So this is a function of arity 3. But if people say, hey, um, can we change the styling of the row? Can we change the styling of the table? Can we add a... Uh, you can see that our arity goes up because we have to pass more information in to 2HTML. Um, we're up to arity 5 here and we're no end in sight. And additionally, let's, let's, um, let's say we put it back into args, right, which is typically what we do. We're still, this is the real problem. This is, this is now variable arity, where you're passing in a structure that, that doesn't have a bound of how many arguments. Uh, we now have named parameters, so that's good. Um, but can we agree that uh, the two HTML function is being exposed to way too much information that it just passes down along the chain, right? Uh, the brown uh, title is the only thing that 2HTML, uh, in fact, 2HTML doesn't use any of the arguments. It just passes them, one of them goes to HTML start, and the rest of them, whatever those might be, go to HTML table. And if we didn't delete args title, HTML table is exposed to the entire you know, application state at this point. So when you see variable arity like this, and the parameters just being passed down and down and down through the call chain, it's a good sign that your concerns are mingled and that your functions and modules are tightly coupled. So here's an illustration. In uh, many procedural applications, the outer functions must know all of the details of the inner functions, which couples them together tightly. Here we have an application, and it invokes foo sub 1, and it passes four arguments. Uh, foo sub 1 takes those arguments, and um, it uses, let's just say, arg 1, and it makes a call. Uh, to sub2 and passes the three arguments down. Sub2 receives those arguments, only uses arg2, passes the rest of them down in a bucket brigade, and so forth, down until we get to arg4. So these, arg4 wasn't used anywhere up the chain, but we needed it because it, it's, it's down there somewhere, and it needs some information that only the application has. Or sometimes it needs some information that the application doesn't have and it has to be collected somewhere else along the way. And now we've exposed our application to some concerns that really are not part of the application. And this is where we now diverge from procedural programming. Procedural programming puts emphasis on process, what must be done or what to do next. Um, Object-oriented programming puts emphasis on data structures and the behaviors that operate on those structures, packaging both of those things into what we call objects. Functional programming allows us to blur the distinction between behaviors and data so that behaviors can be treated as data and vice versa. So like most modern languages, Perl is a multi-paradigmatic language. It means it has more than one paradigm. It was designed as a procedural programming language, but it has um, 
it, it supports object orientation and it supports functional style programming as well. Um, in Perl, we know how to make references from arrays and hashes by prefixing the variable with a backslash, right? Um, in subroutines, we can, we can reference those also. We usually do that by doing um, backslash ampersand subroutine name. Um, but like other Perl variables, they can be created anonymously uh, and then immediately used. We can even pass arguments to anonymous subroutines, as in the second case here. Um, can I get a lurch you rang, Ashton? Very good. So that's, uh, and then uh, I need someone to do a Alfred, Master Bruce. Good British, please. Master Bruce. Very good. You rang Master Bruce. Very excellent. So that's what, that's what these two functions do. They, we are creating a function and then immediately invoking it. In, in Perl, the arrow means to uh, take this reference thing and, and actually use it. So in a hash ref, we have the dollar hash reference arrow curly braces, right? Um, and this, it's no different for subroutines. Uh, in other languages with strong functional roots, like JavaScript, we do this all the time. We pass in functions, we create them as we need them, and then send them on as arguments. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a very familiar pattern in, in many languages. Let's imagine now we want to create a logger, something that logs for us. Now, this really we would probably log to a file. Um, but for simplicity, we're just going to log to standard error, which is not bad. In fact, if... Uh, yeah, it's not bad. So we're going to pass in the log level and the message that we want to log. Now, and this is fine. We, we, we invoke uh, logger uh, at level debug, you are here, and it prints out debug in the square braces because we've got that up in the, in the say standard error. Uh, if we log at level info, info gets printed out and um, there's, our, there's our log message. Now, if we wanted to change the behavior of the logger, we would either have to define a new subroutine or, or, or key off of some of those arguments. We would have to change, we'd add an if statement. Like, let's pretend we wanted to die on fatal log level messages. Um, or send an email if some pattern was, was matched or something like that. So we may be calling other subroutines from within our logger function here. Uh, but then we're back again to passing from the outer procedure parameters only consumed by the inner functions. Uh, and that couples those two things together, those parameters. So do you remember our HP common example from earlier? That method was full of inner methods that were not part of the concerns of the outer method call. And so the outer had to know all of the application state in order to tickle all of those, all of those pieces. So this is now the introduction into functional, uh, a, a functional programming technique called currying. Currying allows us to capture parameters in a subroutine long before they're needed. So here we create a subroutine called logger maker. It takes two arguments. It takes the level and it takes, uh, we'll call it a callback. It's just a subroutine reference. Um, the second argument is optional. And if no one, um, if, 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 it's, if we don't pass in an argument, we get a subroutine that when invoked prints to standard error uh, its first two arguments, and, and the first argument goes into square braces, and the second argument gets printed out. So this is, this is what we would, um, a, a, a log like that, log entry. This log maker returns another subroutine reference. When that subroutine reference is invoked, it calls the callback function. I don't expect anyone to, if, if you've never seen functional programming before, I know this can be a little bit um, unfamiliar. I guess. Um, we'll, we'll see more examples of it though. So the subroutine reference that the, and this is now called a curried function uh, because we've taken a couple of parameters and um, uh, baked them into a, 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 new, a new function. So that this new function closes over these. This is called a closure as well. It closes over these two. There's, there's level and there's the callback. And so as soon as this logger maker goes out of scope, these two uh, variables still uh, are alive because this reference is returned out of the subroutine. So in this case, this, this is a function generator. Here we create, this is, uh, we're going to invoke it here, logger maker, and we're going to pass it level debug. So that's this level here. And because we didn't pass in a callback, we're going to get the default callback. So this dollar debug here is a debug function. When we invoke it, 
those two things right there. When we invoke uh, our debugger there, um, we're, we're passing in a, a series of uh, statements. And you can see because we iterate over all of the statements, we just invoke the logger each time. So if um, this is a, so we say debug, and it prints out debug. Now we didn't have to pass that in because it was passed in when the function was generated. And info works in the same way. We can now just say info, you are here. This is a function, and when we invoke it, because it was created at the info log level, that was captured here, uh, this function now when it is called still remembers level from when it was created. That's called currying. Now we can leverage this curried function callback and create a new fatal logger that dies when it's invoked. So we will now pass in for our log fatal logger, we'll pass in a function that instead of uh, prints to standard error, it actually dies with its arguments. And now we can say when we invoke it, we can say fatal watch this and it, it hits this and dies and this section down here is just not reached. Are there any questions at this point? Does everyone follow this? We'll see some more examples, but I, I do want you to feel comfortable that if, if you need more explanation, I'm happy to do it. Okay? So, let's go back to our HTML module. We're going to accept an anon anonymous subroutine in the row builder parameter and pass it the value of the row. Remember in here, before we were just printing out uh, a print table row, and then for each column we would print the, 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 the TD tags. We're, we're now going to expect a function that will do that for us. And we're going to give that function the hash that, that, that the row represents. That's the ID and the name and the email address. Right there. There's our row builder that we invoke. So now, in order to, to make this work, we need to change our application again. Here's our customer application. So we're going to pass in a third argument. So instead of the rows that we wanted to pass in, we're going to pass in a function. It's an anonymous function called row builder that it accepts a row. And when it receives that row, it will iterate over its columns and, and print out. Um, there's the row that it accepts. And then it prints out each uh, you know, member of the row. So let's try this out. Looks great. So is this better? It certainly gives us more control over what happens in the, in the row loop, doesn't it? We now have full control over, over how those rows are printed. We could add styles and things like that. Oh, we had to change our API a little bit, but, but now we can do whatever we really want. Um, while this does give us a lot of control over the row printing behavior, this application uh, should not be concerned about row tables like this, at least not at this level. So remember our cascading parameters diagram, um, how the outer uh, functions needed to pass in all the arguments to the lower functions? This is the reverse of that. We've now exposed the lower functions guts all the way up into the application. So we have a lot of rope to shoot ourselves in the foot with here. What we need is a row printer builder, something that will create that function for us so that the application doesn't have to worry about HTML and all those the guts of, of what, the, what really are the concerns of the HTML module. And that will help us separate the concerns of the application from the concerns of the interface. So this is what this is. Uh, let's extract the idea of a table row into a function and add it to the HTML package. Uh, because that's squarely in the concerns of the HTML area of concern. A table row has columns, and that's basically all we need to know about a table row. So our function will accept an array reference of column names here, columns, and um, then return a subroutine that will accept the row. This is basically copy and pasted from our application, except with the columns being dynamically provided at the time that the row builder is generated. So this, again, is a closure. It, this, this function closes over the columns variable and keeps it alive. 
as long as that function exists. And it only prints run one row at a time and then it returns. So we don't have to make any changes to our, app, uh, to our 2HTML method at all. We still get to call the row builder. Um, but now our um, application gets small again. So here we create a, um, our unique customer row building function and pass it along to the HTML method right here. And we're passing in an array reference of the column names. And this builds for us, this table row builder builds for us the function that now can be used in the table row builder. And, um, and now we've uh, kind of nicely, uh, we could, we could um, uh, the, the, the concerns of the rows, of building rows stays local to the function. Uh, we could add CSS classes or other row level concerns in that row builder. And uh, the 2HTML method doesn't need to know about them. And the application really is in charge of, still retains control over its business logic, which would be you know, what style to pass in for this application. We might call this a table row printer builder. I don't know. Gets kind of long names here. So let's, let's try this out. All right, everything's looking good. Is this better? Is it good or bad? It's not bad. Um, but it begs the question, why are we not doing this for the HTML table also, right? So let's make a table builder. We can apply this idea to the entire HTML table itself, or even the web page. Uh, we'll stop for our purposes at the HTML table. Um, the, because the point is that we can use functions now as arguments to customize some of the behavior of the functions without adding arguments and without leaking mechanical details inward or outward. So the table builder accepts the row builder and the statement handle and returns a function that iterates over the rows. It creates, this is a table builder, so it returns a function that prints out table, iterates over the rows and invokes the row builder, closes off the table. Look how nice our 2HTML reads now. It reads almost like natural language. We accept two arguments, the title and the table builder. And then we, we invoke the table builder and then we close the HTML tags. Um, the 2HTML method doesn't know about the database, handles, or, or any of the application logic. So this is, this is very clean and easy to understand. Our application has grown by one line. We need to, uh, we, we create our row builder. Uh, this is the employee app, sorry. I, I'll show you both the employee app and the, and the um, customer app because they're in slightly different styles. We create a temporary variable row builder that, is, that has the function that um, we pass in to the table builder. The table builder returns a function that we pass in to, to HTML. And then we can invoke to HTML with the title and that table builder. The customer app doesn't use um, temporary variables. We're using a more um, functional style here um, where we have the, uh, the table row builder is the first argument to the table builder argument, which is the second argument to the 2HTML. So we've just nested those function calls there without the need of intervening variables. And this is starting to look a little bit like Lisp, isn't it? In fact, if we move the open paren to the left of the function name, it would be Lisp. Well, let's look at this. Everything's looking good. Still running fine. Is this better? Good? Bad? We can continue to extend uh, this idea of pushing application decisions uh, into functions rather than parameters. Dorn. The only caveat here is that the application may not read as naturally to a programmer that opens it up. It says it's not as intuitive, it's not as obvious when you're reading it what's going on. Yeah. You kind of have to read it from the end to the beginning. It, that, that's true. There's some, it's definitely a, um, a stylistic difference that we're not accustomed to for sure. And that's the, some people prefer the former where you create your temporary variables so you can give them names and, and, and see and document them. 
And, and some people prefer the latter, where um, they are actually in the order that they're invoked. Just uh, if, if we were to pretty print that second style, it actually looks like an HTML table. It's nested and nice. So the structure of the code looks like the structure of what's actually happening, which is kind of cool. But I agree with you. Yeah, sometimes uh, the functional style uh, definitely is it's, it's definitely unfamiliar. I'll say that uh, to procedural uh, when we, we use procedural programming a lot. Um, so there's one last thing that's bothering me here, and that is it's this database statement handle. Right? If we're trying to really build a generic HTML table builder, why would, why would this have to have a database statement handle? Now, our application requ the requirements of our application were we want you to print the, the, the contents of this table, right? And so we've, we've just kind of pushed that right down into our HTML table module. But this really screams, uh, what if our data were in a, an array or a flat file? We cannot test our HTML module without a database, and that makes me really sad. So this screams separation of concerns and is begging to be ripped out. Um, the concerns of the interface and the concerns of how the data is stored really shouldn't be mingled. So what do we do about this? Pass in a hash, Pass in a hash or, an, or an array reference, right? Or an array or something like that, that contains the rows, is that what you? Okay. Dorn? Pass in a subroutine <clears throat> that retrieves your data. Ah. Pass in a subroutine that retrieves your data. That's called an iterator. An iterator is some function that returns the next item in a sequence. In a database, it would be a row from a table. In an array, it would be the next element. Um, in a flat file, it's the next line. Um, we don't want to bind our HTML interface to any particular storage, uh, which is what an iterator allows us to do. So in this case, uh, fetch row hash ref actually is a nice iterator. Uh, but we don't want to expose that specific iterator to the HTML generator module. So instead, we're going to create a function that hides the idea of the application from the module and the details of the module from the application. So this, this iterator uh, takes a database statement handle, STH. It executes that statement handle. And then it returns a subroutine that, when invoked, will return the next row. Um, and the iterator should return false when there are no more things to read. And thankfully, that's what fetch row hash ref does. Um, iterators allow us to read from a large data stores without sucking up all the memory. We don't have to execute the query, sh sh shove you know, 10 million lines of code into, a, into a, an array, and then um, uh, you know, uh, watch the, um, the out of memory killer come along and, and clobber our application. We only have to allocate as much memory as a single record instead of the entire query response, which could be many gigabytes in some cases. So let's go back to our application. Um, here is our iterator. We're just creating it. It's a single line that we can use now. We will pass that in to the table builder instead of the statement handle. And so this is just a nice incremental change from what we've done before. Our uh, table builder now accepts the row iterator instead of the statement handle. And in our loop, instead of invoking the fetch row hash ref on the statement handle, we just invoke the iterator. Uh, we don't even have to give it any arguments. It just will give me the next row, please. Right there. So this, um, this row iterator could be a database. Uh, it could be attached to a flat file. It could be attached to an in-memory structure. It doesn't matter. And for HTML PM, we don't care. Uh, this separates cleanly the concerns of the storage from the concerns of the HTML interface builder. And now our HTML module really is general purpose. With a little bit of work, we could put this on CPAN, call it HTML Table Builder, and, um, and, and be pretty satisfied with that. Let's run this. That's good. I think I have a, yeah, I've also got an HTML tester in there now. Because now our HTML module isn't tied to the database. And I can now put in a flat file, for example, uh, for my, uh, for my uh, instead of a database. I can attach, uh, I can test the HTML module independent of the database. So is this good or bad? It's pretty good. What we've done, if we, if we compare what we originally had 
Uh, the two applications were 54 lines long for 108 lines total. This latest, where we are now, we've got um, the, 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 the applications are less than half the size they were. And the um, HTML module now exists than it didn't before. So we've only really added five lines of code. But we've gotten an enormous amount of benefit from it by cleanly separating the concerns of the interface from the concerns of the storage and, this, and the business logic that's really part of the application. So this HTML module is now 100% independent and can be tested and deployed with or without a database. So let's take the last step now and remove the storage concerns from the application. So here's our application as it exists today. So see all this stuff here in blue? Um, this is not only duplicated between customer and the employee applications. Um, these storage concerns are really orthogonal to the application's concerns. So let's see what we can do about that. We're going to create a new module called SQLite PM that handles all of this for us. We have a database connect um, method that takes the database name and returns the database handle. And then we have the row iterator that takes the statement handle, runs it, and returns the iterator for us. So here's what we had before. Uh, remember all of this stuff here, use DBI and all this, and we replace it with this, and then with this. So this is again in the functional style. Um, we really just want the row iterator. Uh, now it accepts a statement handle, if you remember. We get a statement handle by invoking the database handle uh, and prepare. Uh, we create the database handle here, invoke prepare on it immediately uh, with this uh, query, which returns a statement handle, which is the argument that the row iterator needs. So we've, we don't have any temporary variables. We could use temporary variables here if that were clearer for you. Um, uh, this, is, this is a little bit more functional style. So while we've saved a few lines in the application, it, we used to have 20 lines basically, now we're down to 13. The real value comes in the fact that we've separated the concerns pretty cleanly. Um, this makes testing the database operations also independent of the application itself. And more importantly, allows the application to be tested independent of the database. We could make some of this iterator uh, stuff happen at um, startup time in a configuration file, for example, and um, just have the iterator come from, from that loader. Oh, and that's just passing in the iterator to the, to the table builder. Nothing else has changed. Nothing in HTML PM has changed. Nothing in any of those functions down below have changed. We're, we're getting the same kind of iterator. So let's look at this. Nice. Same tests, different code. All right. So to put a fine point on what we've done here, let's create a new storage module called flatfile.pm that reads a simple CSV format, comma-separated values. Um, the only method is the row iterator in this case. Um, we accept a file name. We try to open the file name. If we can't, we, we say so. Um, otherwise, we, we pull out the next line. We chomp it, and then we split it. Um, this is not a real CSV parser, but it's close enough for our purposes. It um, parses stuff like that, where we've got an ID, comma, name, comma, email, equals. It's almost not quite CSV. It's more of a key value type uh, format. But uh, it's very simple. And, and so this subroutine, when invoked, will get the next line, parse it, and return a hash reference, just like the database row iterator. It returns the same kind of thing, which is a little hash reference with the ID and the name and the email address. So this is. Uh, Here's what we have today. We have the SQLite uh, thing. If we wanted to test our application without a database, we would swap out those two lines and replace them with these two lines. And we now have an iterator that again gets passed in. No changes to anything else in the code. Just We've just changed the, the storage driver of the application. And now this can be completely tested independent of having a database anywhere. Uh, and as I mentioned, we could move a lot of this kind of stuff into configuration or, a, or an application loader so that the application doesn't even know what kind of iterator it has. Um, shared code is, is um, not the evil. 
uh, thing. It's the coupling between the layers that makes small changes have potentially large impact across a, a, a shared code base. So let's, this is our last one here. Oops. Lovely. So in a functional style, each function, is, each function call is packaged with all of the application specific decisions that it needs when the function is created. This way functions do not depend on the caller's context, which decouples the function from its environment and keeps application specific data and behavior separate from other concerns. Uh, the arrangement of what is inner and what is outer is composed by the application, or at least at the level where it makes sense. Sometimes that would be down inside the module itself. Um, and each of these functions is now independent of the others, and they can be tested independently and deployed independently, which is the real win here. So this right here, here's another way to, to represent that. And you can see that the, the code formatting itself shows you the structure of how things work. That's one of the advantages of a, of a functional style as well. We have foo sub one that takes one argument, and its second argument is another subroutine that takes one argument, whose second argument is another subroutine, and so forth, down to the last argument. So proper functions can give you a way out of some of the coupling that naturally occurs when you use a procedural style of programming. Um, it's one of many techniques we can apply to reduce the amount of state passed between the application all the way down the bucket brigade to the low level functions and modules and library layers. Are there any questions at this point? Anything you want me to go back and look at again? If this is interesting to you, um, the, uh, there are two excellent books I can recommend. Uh, Higher Order Perl is fantastic. It's not only a great introduction to um, learning, uh, using functional programming style in Perl, but it also gives you a great, frankly, a great introduction to functional programming by itself. Um, MJD is a very brilliant person. Dorn. Is that available for free? Yes, you can get that book on um, plover.org, I think is his um, website. Look, just, look up Mark, uh, just look up Higher Order Perl, and it's one of the first couple links. It's a, it's a free ebook. Uh, you can also buy it if you wish. Um, the second book is uh, The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, also known as SICP, also known as The Wizard Book. Um, chapter one is very enlightening just by itself. There's, uh, I think the sec in section three, there's a, there's a um, section called um, Formulating Abstractions with Higher Order Procedures that talks about some of the techniques I've, I've talked about here. Some image credits for the slides. And um, if you want to download these slides or review them again, um, and also the source code itself is available on GitHub. Um, that's it. Are there any other questions? All right, that was fast. Thanks for your time.